Well, you know, in 1972, there was a man who had $600 in his pocket. And he, he made a decision to open a 300-square-foot store to try to sell picture frames that he had manufactured. That small store has since turned into a 3.4 million square foot manufacturing distribution and office complex located at Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. The company's called Hobby Lobby, built totally, built totally on biblical principles. Isn't that exciting? And presently has approximately 430 stores in 35 states. The man who had the $600 in his pocket, I just tried to borrow some money from him and it didn't work, so I don't know what he did with this $600. But the man who started with that in 1972 with $600 in his pocket is the creator of Hobby Lobby, Mr. David Green. And we are really delighted to have him with us. Would you please welcome David Green? I'm always afraid I need to talk to you about administrative assistant of what they might send in terms of bios. In fact, I've had bios sent, and this is my fault, obviously, because I'm the CEO, that after they finished, I was finished. So, uh, and, uh, so if I give you some different numbers than what was read, it's because uh, that was yesterday's news. But anyway, I'm happy to be here with my wife, Barbara. She's sitting up here at the front. And I don't go very many places without her, probably because she carries the phone, and I don't carry one. So that makes it work real good. Besides that, I love my wife. But anyway, I'm also here with a friend, uh, Bill High, who's with us. He's the CEO of National Christian Foundation, and he's an attorney. And so I don't know if attorney and friend uh, goes together, but uh, I've been asked before, what is the secret to your success? And I think the, probably the best thing I could say was only have one attorney for every billion dollar sales you do. And so that's, that's probably one of the greatest secrets that I can give you there. I'd like to tell you uh, a little bit about my story and some of the lessons that I've learned along the way. But to begin, I just want to uh, ask you a question. And that is, why do you think God gives us a business? That's a question that I think each one here asks the, the, from time to time, and, uh, and we will go into that a little bit later. But first, my story. I came from a family of six children. My mother and father were pastors of churches, and uh, actually my father, when I, all the time I was growing up, never pastored a church with more than 100 uh, members. So you can do the math on that, um, 100 members, uh, eight individuals, but God had always supplied our need. It was really uh, good to see how God would supply our need. And the prayer of my parents, and, the, and I, I love the heritage that I came from, pastors uh, that would always pay their tithes, taught us to pay the tithes. And what's so important about tithing as far as parents is concerned is it lets your children know exactly what's the most important thing in your life, and that is serving God first. And so I came up from that kind of a heritage. And I had five brothers and sisters, and they all got into a ministry such as uh, uh, pastors, pastors' wives, except myself. I was the only one that uh, was not in the ministry in that, in that form. And I really considered the, the fact that I must be a black sheep, and, I, and that traveled with me for an awful long time because God didn't call me. There must have been something wrong with me. He didn't call me. And so that was a problem for me for some time. But when I was a junior and senior in high school, um, you know, school was one of my probably worst classes. And uh, <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I didn't like school. And so I took a, a class called distributive education where you could get out of class and you actually got credit for working. So I'm making money getting credits for that. So it, was, it fit me well. Uh, I loved it. At 11 o'clock, I was at work, and I would work probably more than 40 hours a week my junior and senior year, and because we didn't have a lot in my junior and senior year, I spent a lot of my money buying furniture for my parents, and that's how I spent my, my uh, junior and senior year. But while I was working for a McClellan's, which was a five-and-dime store, I, 
uh, I met this young lady called uh, Barbara, Green, Barbara Turner. And by the way, someone that worked in the store told me that she was interested in me. And that's my story. And, uh, <laughs> but the same person told her that I was interested in her. And I think, uh, and she believes that also. <laughs> I really believe that neither one of us were interested in neither the other. <laughs> and there was a busybody. But anyway, it's worked out pretty good. Uh, we've been married for 53 years, and so the gal did a good job. But you've heard the song, some of the older of us are a little bit older, that I met my million dollar baby in a five and 10 cent store. I, I actually did. And uh, I really didn't know what that meant. But since I found out, she was going to cost me a million dollars in shoes alone. And uh, <laughs> we have three children now, and uh, we have uh, ten grandchildren. We have uh, seven great grandchildren. And uh, after we got out of high school, we uh, went right into uh, working. Uh, we moved from uh, T uh, McClellan's to TGNY back in the early 60s. Uh, it was growing fast. They were uh, really the uh, Walmart of the day. And uh, later, of course, they went out of business. A lot of younger people don't even know what TGNY is, but that's where I went to work for. And back to my wife. My wife uh, is a prayer warrior, and uh, she spends a tremendous amount of time in prayer. In the middle of the night, most every night, she journals, 1.30, October the 1st, whatever, and she has dozens and dozens of journals because she is a prayer warrior. And if there's anything that I think has helped our business, of course, it's the prayer of my wife. And so to, to, to know a little bit about my wife, that's that who she is, is a person of prayer. But when I moved to TGNY, I, at the age of 21, I got my first store. And I remember when I got my first store. And you've got to remember, we came from picking cotton. And so think about picking cotton to being a store manager at 21. That was like a big, big deal. You know, I got some keys on my belt here. And I, and I can open the store. And uh, I was the boss. And I would go home. We lived in Oklahoma City then and still do now. That's where our corporate headquarters are. And I'd go home. My mother and dad were pastoring in Texas. And I'd say, hey, Mom, guess what? I, uh, I'm the young, one of the youngest managers ever at TGNY. And her response would always be, yes, Dave, what are you doing for the Lord? So a year or two go by, and I would get one of the largest stores at TGNY. Hey, Mom, guess what? Yes, Dave, what are you doing for the Lord? Then I became a supervisor, a district manager. Yes, David, what are you doing for the Lord? So that's the kind of heritage that I came from, is, is parents that wanted to know, what am I doing for the Lord? And in 1970, while working for TGNY, we started our business. Uh, actually, at that time, ladies were taking little picture frames, I mean one inch by one and a half inch, and two by three, four by five. There's about seven different, six different sizes that we made. And we put a little canvas in them, and they would paint on these small canvases. And uh, they would put a grouping of them on the wall. They don't do that now. That happened then. But it happened just overnight, but there really wasn't any suppliers for that. So we said, oh, we'll make those things and sell them to the Ma and Pa's. And so in 1970, we borrowed $600, and we started making these little frames in our garage. And we would sell them to, we had a salesman that was paid by, on commission that would sell those uh, little uh, frames. Our boys were seven and nine, and we paid them seven cents a piece. That on the living room table, they would put these frames together. They made them for seven cents. And Barbara worked the first five years with no pay at all. So we've been accused of really st starting our business on the backs of slave labor and child labor. <laughs> and... Uh, we really don't argue with that. <laughs> we borrowed the $600, and it took me a year to pay it back. I thought, hey, we made all of our payments to the bank, and the bank was Penn Square Bank, made national news. They were loaning tens of millions of dollars to Ollie's. But I went back to them and to, tried to borrow $1,000, and they wouldn't loan it to me. But anyway, we found somebody that would 
loan us $1,000. And in 1972, two years after we started, we really, our love was retail. That was what I knew, and so we opened our first store in 1972, two years after we started uh, the, making the frames in the garage. And the store was only 300 square feet, which is the size of a small living room. And the back part of it was 300 square feet is where we made the frame. So as we made the frame, so then we would take the money and put it in inventory at the front of the store. So that was our first store in 1972. In 1975, Barbara had done a good job working and building the company up uh, to the point that I could leave TGNY. So five years after we started, in 1972, I left to open the, the second store. I was earning 26000 a year for TGNY, and I came over for 13000 a year. So Barbara and I, had uh, never created a lot of personal debt. I didn't say business debt. Personal debt, and uh, so we were able to do that. Now, if Barbara was up here, she'd tell this story completely different. She started this company. Uh, she worked hard. She got it where the cash flow was running great. She wasn't real sure whether I ought to come over and take charge in 1975. Didn't know whether I was ready for it. but. She, she has a whole different story, and, and probably it's probably closer to the truth than I'm telling you. <laughs> In the mid-'80s, we had 12 stores, and uh, things were going well. I did very well at TGNY. I climbed the ladder. Things were going great with uh, Hobby Lobby. And uh, we had 12 stores, but then there was the, the, the oil bust in the mid mid-80s, uh, and the banks were uh, really talking about foreclosing on us. And for me, it was probably the worst times and the best times, because for me, it was about my pride. You know, God hates pride. Uh, Walt was talking about some of the things God hates, and I think it's kind of related to what he talked about last night. God hates pride, and... Uh, I could not say that that was not a big problem for me because he wants us to be successful, but can he really trust us with success? And he couldn't trust me. And so I found myself under my desk uh, day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out, just at crying out to God, you know, to help save us. We had a meeting with the family. My oldest son said, Dad, it's not you we're depending on. We're depending on God. And that was... That was a great, great relief to know that that's how he saw things. My younger son said, hey, Dad, why don't you come to the house? You know, I have some questions to ask. Well, I came over to the house. I don't remember him asking any questions. He started talking to me about debt and how God does not want us in debt. And so those were two learning experiences besides really trying to learn about pride. If Paul had to die daily, surely we have to die daily. And we've tried to learn that from this experience in the mid-80s. 